this point in the program, I am very pleased to welcome Robin Hayes to speak here at the Wings Club Foundation Luncheon. Robin is the uh, chief executive of JetBlue, not that he needs much introduction, but JetBlue carries over 40 million customers annually with an average thousand daily flights to destinations in the US, the Caribbean, and Latin America. Robin joined JetBlue in 2008 and served as the company's executive vice president and chief commercial officer and then he became the president of the airline in January 2014. In 2015, Robin was appointed as JetBlue's third chief executive officer. Prior to joining JetBlue, he served as executive vice president for the Americas with British Airways. Robin is director for the Partnership for New York City, Inc., and is a member of the IATA Board of Governors. We're also honored to have him as a member of the Wings Club Foundation Board of Governors. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Robin Hayes. Good afternoon, everyone. I have some very brief remarks. Thank you very much. Uh, for those of you who have uh, braved the weather to be here, thank you very much, and I do have an apology in advance because I am rather rudely going to be tearing out of here uh, when I finish because I've got to get a three o'clock flight to LaGuardia, I mean from LaGuardia, <laughs> to Boston uh, because uh, I've got to speak at an event there. So I don't mean to be rude, but there are a load of amazing JetBlue people here, crew members and crew leaders who will entertain you and answer any questions you have. So just a couple of brief introductions. Can I just, uh, Joanna Garrity, who's our president and chief operating officer. Joanna, can you stand a second? <laughs> if any of you are flying this afternoon or have any questions or concerns about your JetBlue service, then please find Joanna. She's wearing a <laughs> blue jacket. And then next to her, we have Steve Priest, uh, our chief financial officer. If any of you are long-suffering business partners of JetBlue or you're waiting to get paid, uh, then please, uh, Steve, can you uh, stand up? I'm going to pass over Rob for a minute because I'm going to come back to him. Uh, and then we have Doug McGraw, who's our head of corp uh, corporate communications. We have him here. And we have Mike Elliott, our chief people officer. And we have a number of other JetBlue leaders and crew members. Thank you very much for coming. I can't believe you come to listen to me again. So uh, also to my friends at Airbus, uh, we're very proud to fly Airbus airplanes. Um, I don't know how those Boeing airplanes got up there. Boeing. Boeing, yeah. You don't do that when Boeing airlines are here, though. No, okay. Anyway, so we'll be giving away some Boeing airplanes by looks of it as well. So Frank, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, and um, good to see many, so many faces here. And uh, to uh, all my friends on the uh, Wings Club board, I actually went to a meeting today, so I'm out of Tom's uh, bad books for a while. And uh, for those of you who have traveled, welcome to our hometown. Welcome to the uh, city of New York. Uh, and uh, as New York's uh, only hometown airline, uh, we love, uh, love having you here. And uh, talking of, uh, uh, do, um, talking of uh, JetBlue, uh, one more introduction I want to make is to Rob Land. Now, Rob Land is our uh, head of government affairs uh, down in DC. He's JetBlue's longest serving crew member. Uh, he's just completed 20 years of service. Uh, and our first flight was 18 and a half years ago. So I don't know what he was doing for the first 18 months. <laughs> But I, I've, now, I've now tried to do this five times at internal events, which is to wish Rob a happy 20 year anniversary. And every single event I've done it at, he's left uh, before I got to it. Uh, he tends to leave early sometimes. Uh, so Rob Land, please stand up. We're gonna give Rob Land 20 year anniversary. Big round of applause. Okay, so uh, about 20 years ago, uh, an uh, uh, innovator, an entrepreneur called David Nilman, uh, who I think uh, many of us know and we'd all agree, he's one of definitely the greatest visionaries in our industry. Uh, he came together uh, with some other founders, so Dave Barger, who I think was the last JetBlue person up here uh, who spoke. Uh, and they had this vision and this dream of creating uh, a customer-focused, low-cost airline that could uh, find a place and thrive in one of the most notoriously tough, expensive, and challenging markets in the world. 
Uh, they, those JetBlue founders brought a much needed breath of fresh air uh, into the airline industry uh, after the challenges carriers faced in the 80s and 90s. And uh, JetBlue, uh, we, uh, we have a facility in Orlando called JetBlue University. Uh, and every two weeks, uh, I, Joanna, and Steve, and other Rob, and other leaders go down there. We meet every single new crew member who's joining us. And uh, we play a game with them. In the first morning, the first thing we do, and the game is called Mergers, Bankruptcies, or Both. Uh, and we go through the history of the US airline industry uh, in the 80s and 90s, and then whatever we call that decade after the 2000s, which I don't really know what the name is. But uh, we talk about how terrible this industry has been, how tough it's been. And so JetBlue was being formed at that time. You remember the, those era, job losses, labor strife, a declining customer service, uh, and the countless rise and falls of many startups. And then more challenges came, right? So we had uh, JetBlue's first flight, February the 11th, 2000, and then we had 9-11 uh, shortly after that. Uh, and then uh, fuel spikes, uh, and then uh, the greatest economic downturn uh, we saw in the US since the Great Depression. And on top of that, we saw a lot of industry consolidation, uh, leaving commercial aviation in this country almost completely reshaped from top to bottom. But JetBlue's still here. You know, we're approaching uh, 20 years. Uh, we've had amazing uh, community support uh, in that time, and we have big plans for our future uh, to expand on our founder's vision of making air travel better and more accessible for all. So it's funny when we look back at the early days of JetBlue, and many airports told us they had no room for us. Now, they had room for us. You know, their arms were being twisted by some of the larger airlines not to let us in. Uh, no slots, no gates, no way was the uh, call of many airports at the time. Uh, by the way, many of these airports now become JetBlue destinations. Uh, and we have great partnerships and great relationships, uh, which just goes to show that we don't hold a grudge. Uh, for, so for 20 years, we've continued to press governments and airports to break down the barriers for entry for carriers like JetBlue. There's no doubt, and I'm going to give you some examples in a minute, that smaller, low-fare airlines can have a big impact on competition when it comes to both price and service. So almost about two decades ago, back in uh, June 2000, and just a few months after our first flight took off connecting Kennedy Airport with Fort Lauderdale in Buffalo, David Neilman testified to Congress on the potential implications of the US Airways United merger at the time. So bear in mind, this, what I'm about to read you, this quote is nearly 20 years old, and it was said by David, and we only found it uh, recently as we were preparing for these comments. He predicted, and I quote, this industry consolidation could conceivably result in three or four major carriers carrying upwards of 85% of all US domestic traffic. When he said this, the top four carriers were carrying 55% of traffic. As an entrepreneur who has started and then sold companies, including an airline, I am not against airline mergers per se, nor am I against the concept of this merger. However, industry consolidation, such as would occur through this merger and others, absent protections for smaller carriers trying to compete fairly in the domestic marketplace can only be seen as harmful to the American consumer. Again, that was back in the year uh, 2000. We were very lucky that in the early days, uh, the US Department of Transportation believed a lot in JetBlue. They knew that if we succeeded, we would catapult Kennedy from being an underutilized, mostly international airport with fewer operations than DCA at the time into a very robust domestic airport as well. People used to joke in those days that for much of the day, you could roll a bowling ball down Kennedy's runways and not hit anything. And it wasn't far from the truth. But now things have changed. In the, in the year before JetBlue launched, JFK handled about 30 million passengers. Today, the number has soared to about 60 million. And the airport, as we know, is busy at all times of the day and, and many times at hours of the night. That tremendous growth has come from JetBlue. Uh, we carry about 14 million annual JFK customers, as well as our competitors' response to JetBlue. Proof of the power of low-fare airlines and new consumer-friendly airline models that stimulate demand and benefit customers and communities. Kennedy's transformation, though, here in New York, and similarly, at our other focus cities of Boston and Fort Lauderdale is no doubt uh, one of the greatest successes of airline deregulation, which we just celebrated 40 years of, and is exactly what the economists and consumer advocates predicted in the late 70s when they convinced Washington to get out of the airline business. Or so they thought. 
Whilst United and US Airways, as we know, never merged, David's prediction about the consolidation of power ultimately became true. Today, four airlines control about 80% of the US market, along with the vital facilities airlines need to operate in key markets. And sadly, despite the clear evidence that carriers like JetBlue drive tremendous consumer benefit by creating new demand and disciplining the high fares of the legacy airlines, not all communities and airports have rolled out the welcome map. Even today, we face challenges getting access to the airport infrastructure necessary to support our services in certain cities. You look at some of the airport leases around the country, and it's almost as if the legacy airlines have written them themselves. The fact is, some of the most established and important markets are the, in this country, the infrastructure is tightly controlled by a few deep-pocketed airlines. I think it's odd that the large airlines keep hyping competition and talking about how the industry has never been so competitive. But for the small airlines like JetBlue, we've never found it harder to get access. So let's give some examples. One of my favorites, I'm sorry, Atlanta. Um, one airline in Atlanta has control or rights over 147 of the airport's 193 gates. That's more than 75% of the gates in that airport. Why we are not able to lease a single gate of that 193, literally not one. We have 10 flights a day and we are forced to operate them over many gates spread over two distant concourses. And that's after we had a commitment that that wouldn't be the case. Here in New York, we have an airport in Newark, which is dominated by one carrier, again, with limited growth, uh, gate space and growth opportunities available for carriers like JetBlue to come in and lower fares. LaGuardia remains limited by slot restrictions and the high cost or total inability by any means to acquire recently available slots. They, when slots be, do become available, they tend to go to the larger airlines. And we don't expect a handout. We bid aggressively on some slots that became available in LaGuardia recently, but we lost out to a much more deeply pocketed uh, airline. Yet, unfortunately, we have several airlines squatting on slots or using smaller jets uh, with 76 or fewer seats to serve major markets. And the largest carrier at LaGuardia operates more than 50% of its flights on this small aircraft. At LaGuardia, we've also seen repeated calls for to end the perimeter rule which would add another layer of complexity to the competitive landscape in favor of established legacy airlines. That is, of course, unless divestitures or other remedies are required to level the playing field. So I don't imagine that these challenges are gonna end anytime soon, but it doesn't mean that we're, not, we're gonna throw our hands up in the air and accept this reality. JetBlue, we've been a fighter from day one, and that's not changing. It's too important for consumers to have a choice in air travel. We know what happens to fares and traffic when low-cost carriers enter a market. We also know what happens when low-cost carriers are forced to retreat from a market. Fares rise and traffic drops. We've seen this at JetBlue over and over again. As an example where we've exited from two markets out of JFK over the last few years, legacy carriers raised fares by 65 and 75% shortly afterwards and traffic plummeted. Over time, it's become more and more important in my role to make sure that the benefits of competition and the importance of open skies to carriers like JetBlue are truly understood in Washington. I'm having to spend more of my time on Capitol Hill to counteract the heavy lobbying of the big three. One of the topics on the minds of many that I speak to down there is how did it get like this and has it gone too far? Sure, consolidation, mergers, bankruptcies and layoffs have made these brands healthier than ever. But I believe it's come at a cost to consumers. Just look at the fares in some of the fortress hubs and in some of the legacy dominated markets without low fare competition. Chances are you'll see fares that are higher than they should be. And in that construct, there's very little incentive to provide great service or to innovate. So let's talk about some examples right here in New York. Before JetBlue announced its flight from LaGuardia to Boston, the cheapest walk-up shuttle fare on the two airlines that were quote unquote competing was an eye-popping $443. $443 to fly to Boston. One year later, with JetBlue in the market, it was $204. The 14-day advanced purchase fare was $165. And one year later, with our entry, it fell to $82. This is what JetBlue and low, low fare competition is all about. 
anyone who has traveled between Boston and LaGuardia in the last two years can attest to. It's, if you doubt how significant this change is for consumers, look no further than the other shuttle route at LaGuardia to DCA, where fares today are pretty much exactly where they were to Boston before JetBlue's entry. In fact, the cheapest walk-up fare, which is often relied on by business travelers from LaGuardia to DCA, is about $480. One of the most profound changes of our industry resulting from consolidation is the way mega airlines treat new competition. Big airlines have always pressured the little guys, and we're used to that, but it's become more and more blatant. They don't want to see any new ground to new entrants that try to come on the scene. I believe that's why we saw the big three unite to wage an aggressive lobbying and PR campaign in the open sky subsidy fight against the Gulf carriers, including those relentless attacks on fifth, fifth freedom flights by foreign carriers, but of course not on their own or their partners' flights. And now we see uh, one of those Delta making a bid for Alitalia, or so it's speculated, and some speculate the Italian government might sweeten the pot by stepping in to absorb the debts. So they were four subsidies during bankruptcy, against them during the big three open skies dispute, and now maybe okay with them again. It is hard to keep up. The protectionist approach of the legacies also explains why they were so up in arms when JetBlue won the right to carry government traffic on certain international routes with our code share partners. This was in full compliance with the F Fly America Act, and its decades-old rules, which the legacy airlines helped to create. It was the legacy airlines themselves that lobbied for this exception long before JetBlue even existed. And they continued to carry government traffic with, guess what, their code share partners. So for them, it's never really been about consumers or national security or the exaggerated claims of masses, massive US airline job losses and rope cuts, which actually have only ever come from their bankruptcy filings, uh, although all of it makes great headlines. Instead, we believe these efforts have simply been about protecting their market share and expanding it even further. So obviously, we take a very different view at JetBlue than many of our competitors. We believe that regulators should be doing everything they can to make it possible for new players and new models to have a fair shot at competing. Right now, we're hearing a lot of noise about Air Italy, the latest in a long list of airlines the legacies have tried to stop. The big three are now lobbying against this tiny carrier and their two flights from Milan to the United States. We find it hard to figure out how Air Italy is anything but compliant with the EU-US Open Skies Agreement, as its majority owned by EU shareholders, holds a validating operating certificate by an EU member state, and is no different to Air France, KLM, Virgin Atlantic, BA, and other partners of the US legacy airlines. And before that, we had Norwegians battle for US operating permit in the legacy's campaign to curtail so-called flags of convenience carriers. After years and years of the US stalling and failing to live up to its treaty obligations in the face of some pretty clear, plain and unambiguous language, solely it appears to, for political reasons, the US, the EU never once took retaliatory action, although it surely had every right to do so or was tempted to do so. Fortunately, in the end, it turned out okay, and the US found all of, all of the challenges to Norwegian's requests were without merit under the Open Skies Agreement. Our Norwegian was welcomed to the free market of competition where it now has to chart its own path to success, but not because those commercial interests seeking its failure were, ably, were wrongfully able to use the power of government to ensure it never got off the ground. The EU stood for the rule of law and free markets, something that we Americans typically think we corner the market on. This debate has been concerning for JetBlue because of the last, the last thing we want to see is any kind of retaliation from Brussels if and when we decide to fly to Europe. And we've made no secret that we're thinking about it. As we build out our New York and Boston focused cities, it's a natural extension of our strategy to serve places that our customers want to go. For example, in Boston, where we are the largest airline, London is the largest market that we don't serve. But as we think about transatlantic uh, market, as we think about the transatlantic market, we know, we, we, which we know holds a lot of potential for us to repeat the success we've seen in our current geography. But we know we'll face certain challenges. Access for new entrants into constrained airports like Heathrow, let alone growth once a carrier is there, can be exceedingly difficult, just as it is domestically in places like Atlanta, 
because of the consolidation of power. By the way, one of the biggest carriers in, carriers in Europe last month touted industry consolidation as one of their main drivers of optimism in the industry. And by optimism, they mean profitability. Today, these three alliances control close to 80% of the transatlantic market. Then within the alliances are the joint ventures, which have been granted antitrust immunity to coordinate price and schedules, things that would otherwise be considered unlawful collusion absent a government grant of immunity from, from, these, from these consumer protection laws. This is what JetBlue and other entrant, new entrants who try to challenge the power of the legacies are up against. The re reality of antitrust immunity is that it reduces independent competition in the market. If you, have, if, you have these, if you have three airlines teaming up in a JV, the truth is there's only really one entity competing. The fewer competitors that are in a market, the larger and stronger the giants are, and the easier it is to thwart any competition who may try and challenge their position. These powerful JVs now have a grip on nearly 70% of the market between the US and Europe, and they're getting even more powerful. That's why you see fares that simply take your breath away, especially on the premium end, where JetBlue and our Mint product have a real opportunity to change things. There is really no reason other than greed why a business class ticket from New York and Boston to London or Paris can set you back between ten dollars and $15,000. Contrast that to the US transcom market, where since Mint rolled out, publicly filed fares have nearly been cut in half on some carriers. Now we're seeing these joint ventures intermarrying, if you will, and growing even larger by teaming up in cross-complex, cross-ownership equity schemes that muddy the waters and call into questions who is really calling the shots at these airlines. Take Delta, Air France, KLM, and Virgin Atlantic's new joint venture, for uh, instance, which is currently under regulatory review. Delta owns 49% of Virgin Atlantic, and Air France KLM is taking a 31% stake. Separately, Delta owns a stake in Air France KLM, as does China Eastern, and Delta has a chunk of China Eastern too. Can anyone even follow that? And people are complaining about Air Italy and Norwegian structure. How can anyone come up with these structures, complain about Air Italy, a legally operating airline authorized by the EU? Immunized joint ventures in particular have given three already massive US airlines even greater scale and control in some of the most important foreign markets. The trend, trend we, see, we tend to see in JVs is that their fair growth outpaces capacity growth relative to non-JV markets. So let me be clear, as David Neilman told Congress nearly two decades ago, despite what I've just said, we're not necessarily opposed to joint ventures or grants of antitrust immunity, but we don't think that these airlines should be given a permission slip to partner or legally collude indefinitely without any meaningful regulatory scrutiny. We need regulators to periodically check in and ensure that the consumer benefits that these JVs tout when they apply for immunity are actually being delivered to consumers. If governments don't ask questions, JVs, by nature of their scale and market power, can really stifle competition and innovation. When joint ventures were created, we know this, it was a very different time for the industry, and US carriers were nowhere near as healthy as they are now. Back then, it was more about teaming up for survival and skirting the limits on foreign ownerships into US carriers. I don't think anyone could have imagined back then how powerful and profitable joint ventures would become. As the three global alliances have grown in strength and used that unprecedented power to realize a nearly 80% market share in the North Atlantic, we believe competition authorities in the US, UK, and the EU should use their own strength to take stock and force divestitures. These need to come on a size and scale, the likes of which we've never seen before, to ensure that new entrants can have schedules that viably compete with the big three. That's what we need to do, so that new entrants, whether it's JetBlue or anybody else, can bring price and service discipline to these markets, and that we can gain a meaningful competitive buttress against these, from these global alliance giants who have grown to their size with government backing. But it's certainly not all doom and gloom, and there are some signs of hope and things are changing. We were delighted that the US DOT agreed with our view in the joint venture application for Delta and Aeromexico. They were requiring a review after five years to see what actually transpired in the market. They also barred exclusivity. I can't tell you how many airlines come to JetBlue and want to work with us, but they can't. And a practice which forbids, uh, and they barred exclusivity, which forbids carriers in the joint venture from partnering with other airlines like JetBlue. 
They also required a slot divestiture. We received a handful of these at Mexico City International Airport and found it an ongoing struggle to make them work in a competitive environment uh, which was still dominated by Delta and Air Mexico as they teamed up in a JV uh, in the market. Even with, with a slot remedy, immunized JVs have enormous advantages in distribution, point of sale strength, and other competitive challenges that can be difficult sometimes to overcome. It is extremely important that DOT continues to evaluate the new market realities of consolidation and massive barriers to entry as they are harming consumers. Regard, regardless, the Mexico City decision is a great template to follow when airlines seek to link up and it's something we urge governments around the world to consider more aggressively. Across the Atlantic, it's been almost a decade since the massive American-British Airways deal was examined. Think back to what aviation looked like 10 years ago. A decade in this industry is a, is a lifetime, and it's time to take a fresh look. We're confident in closing that regulators will solve some of these challenges I've raised today. We need them to, to ensure smaller players and new entrants have a chance to compete in this new, highly consolidated world. If not, consumers will face decades of high fares. And our friends here, the students of the NYU Aviation Club, they're going to be having to tackle it uh, in their careers. So uh, I'd like to thank my friends at the Wings Club to allow to come and uh, make the uh, remarks. Um, you know, it, uh, hopefully, you, uh, whether you agree with me or not, it wasn't a boring corporate update. Uh, and um, uh, just uh, safe uh, travels, everyone. And uh, we're going to take a few questions. and. Uh, the first question we're going to uh, give to our friends at the NY School of Aviation to ask. Um, so my question is about a different type of venture, not a JV, but um, Jet, uh, JetBlue's technology venture. And um, do you expect to see any like near-term benefits from this, uh, your sort of VC arm, specifically uh, with respect to uh, electric planes and Zunum Aerospace? Yeah, that's a, a great question. So for those of you who I don't know, uh, we created uh, JetBlue uh, Technology Ventures a couple of years ago. Uh, it's based out in uh, Silicon Valley. It's led by its president, uh, Bonnie Simi. And uh, in fact, Bonnie was in town with me. We had a, an event at the Cornell Tech uh, Hub here in New York a couple of days ago. Uh, we're very excited. It's already making us a better company. You know, when we think about the power of the JetBlue brand and the ability to disrupt, not just commercial aviation uh, as we do today, but other parts of the travel experience. You know, Tech Ventures is really at the heart of that, but it's also making us a better airline. So you know, we've invested in uh, over 20 companies now. Uh, we have companies uh, in uh, who are helping us uh, rethink revenue management in a completely different way using AI and uh, machine learning. Uh, we have a company that does, uh, called Climacell, that does really uh, micro weather forecasts uh, that's helping us better understand the impact on weather and operations where we have to make split second uh, uh, decisions. Uh, you mentioned Zunum Aero and uh, Joby Aviation, uh, that we are very think, you know, thinking very thoughtfully about how the regional travel uh, industry may get disrupted uh, over the uh, next few years. And uh, you know, another great example is a company called Gladly, uh, which uh, has really started to transform how we interact with customers at the front end. You know, whether a customer texts us, calls us, emails us, uh, contacts us through social media, we now have a single view. Uh, of their uh, contact with JetBlue, whereas in the old days you used to call up and we, never, we didn't really have very good information if this customer was trying to also talk to us through other channels. So it's making a big difference to our crew members' ability to uh, provide that service for our customers. So uh, yeah, it's really exciting. I think we're all really excited by it and uh, you know, we're going to continue to make some great investments to uh, help disrupt and transform this industry. Hi, Robin. Thanks for taking my question. My name is Kim. I'm from Flight Global. Um, you mentioned that you're concerned that the EU might retaliate against the airline in the future, even when you decide to start those flights. Could you talk a bit about how big of an impact is that concern in your decision on whether you go ahead, and what else are you deliberating on um, in the process to begin those flights to Europe? Thank you. No, thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Kim. And I'm sorry, sorry we didn't get a chance to connect earlier. No, look, I, my point actually... Uh, I really was uh, wanting to compliment the EU. I think they grow, showed great restraint uh, during this whole process. Uh, I know it was very frustrating for them as it was uh, uh, for us. Um, and I think we as JetBlue was just very keen to avoid being putting in a position where we could be the US airline if they chose to retaliate, that they would re retaliate uh, 
uh, against us. You know, uh, clearly, uh, this issue about whether we're going to fly to Europe has been around uh, for a while. It's something that we're actively working. You know, a number of things have to fall in place, but one of the things that has to fall in place for us to go is making sure we can offer competitive schedules at the airports that people want to fly to. And so that this issue that we've covered today uh, is very important uh, as part of that uh, uh, decision. And so, uh, we, you know, we continue to work that uh, amongst other things. Thanks for the question. Again. Hey, good afternoon, Robin. Yeah. Ron Dunsky with Passer Aerospace. I was just curious, how does JetBlue feel about its, uh, its new neighbors in Long Island City, Amazon, and uh, also the likelihood that uh, Google is also going to expand just across the river? Is, is, uh, are you ready for it? Is New York ready for it? Well, uh, um, you know, first of all, we are excited. Uh, we actually uh, um, we moved to Long Island City in 2012, so we kind of felt we were the advanced party. Uh, it's a great neighborhood. Uh, you know, I think that um, uh, the, uh, the folks that work at JetBlue, they love to see more stores. You know, we're waiting for a, uh, uh, waiting for a pharmacy uh, to open. Uh, and so I do think the influx of companies like Amazon will uh, make, a big, uh, make a big difference. That. So we're excited. You know, there are, there are constraints. I mean, uh, there's a lot to think through. You know, access to housing, access to schools, transportation. Um, but I'm assuming that there's lots of people smarter than that smarter than me thinking about that. But overall, I think it's great for New York, uh, and I think um, it's going to be great for us. I mean, we're New York's hometown airline. Uh, we have one of the biggest brands that's now going to partly call New York home, uh, and we're looking to flying all those Amazon executives backwards and forwards uh, between JFK and Seattle or anywhere else they want to go. Thank you. Robin, we, we would like for you to have this plaque. It reads, uh, presented to Robin Hayes, in grateful appreciation for your presentation at the Aviation Leader Series of the Wings Club Foundation, New York, November 2018. Great, thank you very much. Thanks, thank Frank. You. Thank you. Thank you.